Coming up on Smart Tech Today, Matthew Casanelli and I are here. We are excited because there's so much to talk about. But first, it starts with some kind of bummer news. Wink, that uh, smart hub manufacturer, it's adding subscriptions. But Google is making things a little bit easier whenever you want to connect to streaming services. And it turns out that 44 million U.S. adults use borrowed accounts for streaming services. Are you one of them? We've got all that plus so much more, including some tips on AirPods replacements on this week's episode of Smart Tech Today. Stay tuned. Smart Tech Today is brought to you from Twit's LastPass Studios. You're focused on security, but are your employees? Well, LastPass can ensure that they are by making access and authentication seamless, whether they're working in the office or remote. Visit lastpass.com slash twit to learn more. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This episode of Smart Tech Today is brought to you by Molecule. Molecule is reimagining the future of your health with clean air, starting with the air purifier. For 10% off your first air purifier order, visit molecule.com and enter code STT. And by Casper. Casper is a sleep brand that makes expertly designed products to help you get your best rest one night at a time. Get $100 towards select mattresses by visiting casper.com slash STT and using the promo code STT at checkout. Welcome to Smart Tech Today, the show where we explain the exciting, the dynamic, and the sometimes confusing subject that is the Internet of Things. I am one of your hosts, Micah Sargent. And I am your other host, Matthew Casnelli. (laughs) <laughs> yes. How you doing, Matthew? I'm doing pretty good. I am here in my slightly blue room. I'm trying to go for some smart tech today lighting vibes now. Yeah, so. you know, I need to get that set up here. Um, not least of all because I'm constantly teased by about my very gray uh, room that I have. But you know what? <laughs> I just I just like to keep it simple. Minimalist. Uh, yeah. K I S S. You know. Um, anywho, we've got a lot to talk about today. Uh, so let's kick things off with a bit of a perplexing bummer um, for for some folks. Certainly not for me and i don't think for you um Mm -hmm. but it is something that came by and thought we should talk about and that is wink wink is a it kind of looks like a router it's it's a sort of uh, hub device that you plug into your router and then it serves as a go-between for certain smart home products uh that you can then use the wink hub to control well Wink decided that, hey, we're not doing so hot. So that device that you purchased and have been using for (laughs) so long, uh, now we're going to require you to pay a monthly subscription if you want to continue using this product. Yeah. You, You can't. What is it that they always say? You cannot give something to someone as as a as a product maker, as a and manufacturer, as a company. Do not give something to someone and then take it away. That's not how you do it. If you do that, you're going to upset people. And that is exactly what Wink is doing. They're giving some, they've already given this thing to people, this ability to use this device. And you paid for it. (laughs) And now you're trying to take it away from me and make me pay more. This is, it makes no sense. Yeah. I mean, they're a little troubled, it seems like. Um, did you say four ninety nine per month? Also, yeah, um, yeah, $4.99. okay, yeah. And they also only gave people <laughs> less than a week. Otherwise, you're kicked off the system. So I think this it does seem like it came from like their backs against the wall, and they just like can't handle the strain of. I mean, they're like long term costs and recent economic events. So as the line goes nowadays, um, but. It is just wild that like a bunch of people who signed up for this are now going to have to sign up immediately. Otherwise, they'll be kicked. It's like they just suddenly ran out of money, it sounds like. Um, I saw another article about this, by the way, that had really bad Will I Am puns. So I'm glad we didn't. We're not <laughs> linking to that one because he invested in the company originally. But oh, I, I mean, there was even that. reports like last year where they hadn't paid people for a while. So I think it's like been on his last legs for a while, but. 
Yeah, I mean, I, everybody's in, p- pivoting to memberships. <laughs> oh my goodness! <laughs> like in that. the blog, <laughs> uh, it says during this time since 2014, uh, Wink has relied solely on the one-time fee derived from hardware sales to cover ongoing cloud cost development and customer support. Uh, look, this is obviously something that should have been considered in the beginning and if it had been considered in the beginning we're going to have you buy this device and then you'll pay 49 a month like people do that already most of the webcams that you purchase most of the smart security cameras that you purchase come with a monthly subscription and people are happy to pay that but you can't have done this thing one way and now expect that people are going to you know, make that switch and give them such little time. I think yeah, that that's there are multiple <laughs> issues here. You know, uh, one possible way would be to, hey, uh, go ahead and have it for new subscribers or or new purchasers, you know, new uh, people and grandfather and everybody else. I mean, there had to have been a better way to do this. And what this, it just, it smells of, what's that? I think I, uh, an aroma of desperation. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. think that's what that is. Yeah, and it's not a good look. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's, they apparently had an extremely capitalist business model where it's like only growth could have gotten them out of the situation that like their inherent business model, if any sort of downturn could have le- turned to something like this. So, I mean, it is also like a, pretty strong parallel to the app store where like a lot of people paid for apps up front and then never again. Yeah. And then a lot of those developers went out of business and then now subscription pricing is like the thing to do. So yeah. it's kind of like the time that we live in, I guess, but it also is just like hard to justify more and more subscription things, especially if it seems like the company might not make it, even if you do do that. So yeah, at least that's... And, and for the life of your product, you can still, Keep it around, but maybe we customers should be looking in a different place. Yes, and in fact, we got a question uh, from listeners uh, or from a listener about this. You know, I have a Wink Hub, and I saw that the subscription uh, service was going to be, you know, coming. What do I do uh, about this? Uh, so, thank you, Daniel, for writing in um, and. Yeah, you are going to have, if you continue to use this and you don't want to pay the four ninety nine fee, not only do you lose access to the hub, you lose access to the API, basically all of it. Um, and Daniel like says, service, you know, yeah. m- most of my smart switches are not HomeKit compatible. Um, they are, you know, available for something else. And then I have an Echo Dot for voice control, but no other Z-Wave controllers. Uh, what, what do I do? Well, there are... Uh, there is an option. <laughs> yeah. Oops. Oops. Uh, <laughs> no, I was going to say <laughs> what you should do is get an Amazon Echo Plus. Um, and let me see here. I just want to confirm uh, again. Yeah. So with Z-Wave is, is uh, one of the communications methods that a lot of different devices use. And of course, uh, Wink was one of those platforms that was listed as that option. Um, but if you want to uh, be able to you know, use Amazon Echo, then going ahead and getting the Amazon Echo Plus can help you because it has, um, or, and I guess that's just, that's just for Zigbee. Um, and so it, it, it's going to depend on which of your platforms you're using, if you're using Zigbee or Z-Wave, uh, to, you know, to be at the base of your, of your smart home, um, which, of course, is still quite a challenge uh, to try and figure out what platform you're going to use um, to sort of be mm-hmm. at the, the center, the hub of your smart home. Um, there is so a, yeah, if you've got bridge. Zigbee devices, then you're good to go. Go ahead. There is a HomeBridge Z-Wave plugin for home... Uh, Z-Wave plugin for HomeBridge. So if you do yes, go that route. But don't you, are, you're still going to need a hub though, right? Because it, uh, how, it, it's not able to oops, communicate with that's the gonna, Z-Wave devices. <laughs> it is, I, I don't know. I just keep going back to hoops. It seems like a solid, If I mean, I don't know. I guess it is like 
it's messy when you already have them and you have to switch platforms. But the either one of those sounds like a pretty solid solution. Yeah, and that's I mean that's the unfortunate thing is that this up to this point was a pretty solid um, option. You know what I mean to yeah. to serve as the the basis for uh, the the hub was it's kind of it's just like ahead. maybe I don't know. I mean, being the platform, I who like you have to have a good way to monetize it basically and. Like Apple and Google don't have to think about that at all, basically, because it's just built into the entire ecosystem. But some of the more independent ones, it's like hard to even justify. In my, I mean, I guess that's just been in my experience, probably because I just like kind of went for stuff that was already HomeKit compatible. But like relying on a third-party platform that is paid also, or like doesn't have a great way to pay for, it. like you basically have to pay for it. Otherwise, you go the open source route, but there's not really like, or it's just a, me- a mega corporation. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, there's the three um, choices. <laughs> yeah, this I, I I don't know. This really <laughs> bums me out because yeah. again, I liked the idea of being able to have the one option that if I'm not using HomeKit or I'm not using the Google Assistant, give me a single device that I can purchase that's going to work with multiple, uh, whatever I choose to, to add to my home. And, you know, that used to be the, uh, option there to, to, I mean, it's still an option, I guess, but hopefully more people, hopefully enough people do pay for it, that it stays an option. So I guess we're kind of treating it like it's already dead. (laughs) Maybe we shouldn't push people away from it. That's well, yeah, I guess, I guess you can keep doing that. Um, I will say, if if you don't want to go that route of it, that route uh, of of doing the subscription, you might go the route of Samsung's platform, Samsung Smart Things. Yeah, so Samsung Smart Things has a hub that it does uh, have Z-Wave radios in it, um, so you can use the Samsung Smart Things. I think it's on its third generation, uh, and so you know that hub, of course, can connect with a bunch of different platforms and serve as the sort of center uh, of your of your home. So if you are looking for a replacement hub um, that kind of powers everything, then the Samsung Smart Things hub can be that because they do have apps for both iOS and Android. Um, and uh, Smart Things, you know, in theory, given that it's part of a bigger company, uh, may very well last <laughs> a lot longer than yeah. what we're used to with um, with these smaller companies that are trying to find new ways to to make money. Um, so yeah, check that out. I'll include a link in the show notes to the Samsung Smart Things Hub, which lets you connect to all sorts of. It's got Zigbee, it's got Z-Wave, it's got Cloud to Cloud, it's got LAN, and it's got Zigbee three. Are the different protocols. Uh, with which it can connect two devices. So both Zigbee and Z-Wave in one spot, like the wink does. Um, <laughs> but from a company that's, you know, backed by a bigger company that's not Will I Am. So, you know, <laughs> have, have legs. <sighs> okay, well, that's enough uh, lamenting that. And uh, Daniel, thanks for writing in. Hopefully that uh, smart things hub can be a good replacement for you. Yeah, um, I was going to say if anyone is that. switching, switching like let us know because I'd be curious yeah. to know what you end up doing. Yeah, if it works for you, um, or if yeah. you end up going with a subscription service, uh, and if you know that it ends up being a cash, what is it, injection? That's a cash injection that rockets wink into the future. I doubt it. Uh, let's move <laughs> on. So. <laughs> This is this is your topic. It's all it's sure. it's about Siri shortcuts. Tell us what's going on. <laughs> um, TP Link has added Siri shortcuts integration for their Casa line of smart accessories. I'm actually not super familiar with these, but I just wanted to mention it because it is like a solid um, alternative again for HomeKit that we've mentioned over time. Where they probably won't get HomeKit anytime soon, but if you do have them, they have like light switches, smart plugs, power strips, and cameras. 
you can use shortcuts to control it. So that's pretty nice. Yeah. Um, I've got um, there's like 10, 10 apps like this now, or smart home things that can run pretty much exclusively from Siri shortcuts or Google and Amazon's assistance. Yeah, I've got one Casa smart plug uh, that I used to just use my Amazon Echo to control. Uh, but if I can talk to Siri with it as well, and that's nice. I just, I do wish that, you know, there was, yes. And that's the thing. Uh, so for folks who are watching, you can see these Casa smart plugs. Um, you can get a two pack of them for 20 bucks. That is mm. very inexpensive. Very, very, very inexpensive. And along with being only 20 bucks for two of them, so $10 a piece, they're also incredibly small, which is nice yeah. because you can stack them. So you can have two in one spot, which is really nice, um, which is, you know, some of the other plugs have that issue. So I think that the, the Casa uh, smart plugs are good save for the fact that for me it is a bit of a workaround to use them with my um home and i will yeah I, a lot of people don't think about this first of all but they are ul listed um which is an important consideration for any electronic device that you're going to plug into your wall particularly if you live in an old berkeley home what exactly does that mean i don't think um it, so ul listed it's it's a it's sort of a certification that shows that the product is uh electrically sound essentially yeah. so you know that it's made with top quality materials and that it passes tests uh to make sure that the product is not going to uh by design just fry your your device uh or fry you know have an issue whenever you plug it into the wall so you should always buy if you buy extension cords if you buy extenders if you buy different things Always make sure that they are UL listed um, before you decide to put them in your home, because otherwise, you know, it's 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 a bit of a, a concern. Um, <laughs> and I don't know what UL. I don't know if UL ends up standing for anything. Originally known as the Underwriters Electrical Bureau, uh, UL was founded in Chicago. Uh, so yeah, I just. You see that UL listed logo or a little emblem and you know that it had to pass certain standards uh, before you could, you know, sell it and put that little badge on there. So nice. just a little bit of extra comfort knowing that you're plugging something into your wall that's been tested. <laughs> yeah. Uh, let's see. Rings doorbell. It's the... The budget model, uh, Verge calls it the, or no, sorry, that's in Gadget. In Gadget calls it the uh, entry level version, has 1080p video, and it even has motion zones. So it was kind of, you know, up, up in the air how developed, how detailed, how good the uh, Ring video doorbell, the new version, was going to be. And it seems, I mean, it's got great video quality, uh, 1080p yeah. HD instead of 720p. Um, and then also motion zones, which that is a way to say, hey, camera, I want you to pay attention to these areas and not areas outside of this because I don't care if the neighborhood cat is running around over here, but I do want to know if someone's walking up to my door. Uh, so those are, I think those are necessary. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it just seems like a good, nice, if you are interested in Ring's services and are willing to accept some of their security practices, then it's a good solution for like the, the base model. And they are mostly on pre-sale right now, but it'll be out in about a month. Sweet. Yep. Uh, let's see. Oh, this is kind of fun. What happens when you combine near-field communication and wireless charging. Well, that is what the NFC forum has uh, come together to find out. Tell us about this. This is interesting to me. Um, yeah, this is. I wanted to include this both also because of my reaction because I was like, "Oh, this sounds really cool." And then they're like, "It only does one watt of power compared to G, which is five watts." And then like faster G that you can get. That's like up to fifteen watts. So it is very interesting where like you could potentially power um, like smaller external devices just by holding it up to your phone and using the NFC tag or the NFC chip in it to just like pass a little bit of energy back and forth. Um, they're talking about things like headphones or fitness trackers, but 
I do like my immediate thought was Apple's like rumored tile like tags product or something like oh, that. Oh yeah, you just hold your wait. phone to it and top it up for a month. Yeah, like tiny <gasps> little or like Bluetooth beacons where you could kind of just like plop it onto your phone for an hour and then because it's so low power, it lasts for a really long time. Or like yeah. even, I don't know, I mean, I guess it, <laughs> my imagination was like just when you touch it, it does it, but that's probably still not enough. Um, but it sounds pretty interesting. It's like another way to pass the charging back and forth. Like, um, I don't remember which of Samsung's phones it is, but they can charge their headphones just like mm. on the device, which is pretty cool if you like, if it dies right when you're using it. But I do find fast charging, like, I mean, I've said before, I, I waited for a really long time to find a Qi charger that was 15 watts and only $40 because I was like, I don't want to pay more money for a slower charging experience. Um, but the the Verge article was like, you could kind of just use both. It doesn't have to be one or the other. So it could be just like a little extra juice or something like that. Yeah, the fact that it, instead of using charging coils, it's using the one antenna, and that antenna does both communication and charging for the device. Uh, that is pretty cool. Yeah, and I, I love the idea of if I've got some small device in my house, maybe a motion sensor, and I get the notification, hey, running low on battery, and I just boop, hold my phone up to it for yeah. you know a couple like minutes lean it against or something. It. Ooh, yeah. I just imagined like a, a phone stand that also charges via NFC and somehow adds some other benefit that I haven't thought of yet. But <laughs> like, <laughs> but just like, like random little products could be powered instead of not like, yeah, it's like other tiny little products could be become powered by just like sticking it on your phone for a little bit. So that yeah. I do think like beacons or stuff like that could be a really cool opportunity. Very I guess cool. that's Bluetooth. So... <laughs> I don't know. We'll, we'll think we'll it through. Think but it's brand new. Yeah. It's like they just came out with it, so it won't come through phones. But it is, it is fun to like think about and see how we could use it over time. Well, and I think about those little flick buttons um, or other. Yeah. I mean, Philips Hue used to, and I can't remember if they ended up discontinuing it because of all of the issues. But they used to offer a controller that. Not that. Um, oh. That that's what I'm talking about I when I say I had flick this. and those. <laughs> yeah, but. Philips, you used to offer one that didn't have a battery at all. It was simply charged by the um, um, like kinetic the energy pressure. of touching it. And so that tells you how little power it needs to have to be able to communicate. Yeah. Um, so with that in mind, you know, one watt of, of charging power, you you put your phone up to the button for 30 seconds and it plays a little animation on your phone so that you have something to look at while mm -hmm. you're waiting for it to charge. And then it's good for another month or two months or something. Yeah, that, that's like plenty. Yeah. And that that what's great about that is that it also is reducing waste and, you know, you're not getting batteries every time and having to throw away old battery like that. There's there's a lot there that and I just the idea of wireless power. Oh, true wireless power. I'm all about it yeah, all the time. Anytime. Cool. I just imagine like charging your phone from your iPad and then the watches on the phone also charging. <laughs> Yeah, yes. I mean, now that I think about it, like the iPad Pro does charge through the contacts on the back. I guess that's not wireless. I guess no. I mean there's no wires, but it's still contact, it's still connect charging. So, yeah, but cool. the um, the Apple Pencil is charging wirelessly on the. Oh uh, yeah, side. that's fair. I mean, it requires the you have to be right there next to it, but it is charging it. Uh, let's take How a quick did I break. I don't even think about that. Sorry, just it is like <laughs> the fact that the, <laughs> the pencil charges you. wirelessly all the time. It's like, oh yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> it's there. Uh, let's take a quick break though, because I do want to tell you folks about breathing easier with Molecule, uh, who are bringing you this episode of Smart Tick today. Molecule now offers its breakthrough Pico technology across a range of products providing a solution for the entire home when it comes to air purification. Whether you need the Molecule Air for large rooms or the Molecule Air Mini for smaller rooms, you can now choose the unit that's best for your space or create a bundle to provide an air purification solution for your entire home. PICO, that thing that I was just talking about, stands for photoelectrochemical oxidation. And it is a technology that destroys VOCs, volatile organic compounds, you may have heard of, it, of them, uh, bacteria, mold, viruses, and allergens. Now, here's the thing. 
you may have heard about uh, about Molecule and its comparison to some of the other air filters out there and the conversation surrounding that. And so Molecule is uh, ready to get down into the nitty gritty of it and talk about the differences here. So Pico is Molecule's technology and HEPA is the one that you're probably used to. Well, here's the deal. HEPA filters have not been updated in 70 years. It's almost as old as I am. They were invented back in World War II and have pretty much remained the same. Molecules filtration system doesn't just collect pollutants on antiquated filters like HEPA. It destroys them on a molecular level. Traditional filters, they do collect larger pollutants, but smaller ones can still slip right through those filters. And while they may seem small, these tiny particles are a big deal to allergy and asthma sufferers. Molecule is your best defense against allergy season. You're creating truly clean air, combating allergy season by destroying allergens in any room in your home. Now, breathing clean air, of course, can help you sleep. Uh, placing that molecule air purifier next to your bed cleans the air you're breathing. And customers have reported feeling energized after getting the best night of sleep they've had in years. And of course, cleaner air is healthier air. Look, a lot of us are stuck in our homes, uh, having to live at home, work at home, breathe at home, eat at home, sleep at home. And what is better than being able to continue to keep that air clean, particularly if you keep your windows you know, closed, if you've got AC or, or heat, depending on how the temperatures are where you are, you kind of need to have something in your house cleaning out that air. And that is why uh, this is a, a good choice for you. Now, Molecule, it's been tested, it's been vetted, and it's been proven. In fact, Molecule's Pico technology, that's that new type of, of uh purification technology and its filtration systems have been tested and verified by third-party laboratories like the University of Minnesota Particle Calibration Laboratory and Entertech, so you know you can trust them. Get Molecule Air for large rooms or the Molecule Air Mini for smaller rooms or bundle to cover your entire house. Uh, I think Leo has said it before, Lisa can always tell when the Molecule Air is not on and uh, turning it on again course starts to clean out the air make it all the better it's fantastic so for 10 percent off your first air purifier order visit molecule.com and enter the code stt at checkout that's m-o-l-e-k-u-l-e.com and enter the code stt at checkout our thanks to molecule for sponsoring this week's episode of smart tech today well google says Look, we work with lots of different streaming services, so why not get signed up? Uh, you are prompted now when you launch the Google Home client to go ahead and link your Netflix account, your, your Hubu account, your <laughs> whatever streaming services you have. Get those connected, get those linked, and um, it makes it you know, easier to be able to see these different streaming services across your different devices if you've got a hub or uh, a Chromecast or what have you, then it uh, makes it easier to link those together. Yeah, this is just a nice quality of life thing where it's just like when you sign up for Google Home stuff or if you haven't linked it together, it's uh, it just props it prompts it for you because they know that you're, it's like it's probably through your Google account anyways. So um, yeah, pretty pretty straightforward. I do. I am always disappointed that I can't watch Netflix on my um, home hub. That's like that would be such a killer feature, and I think it's it doesn't qualify as a TV in Netflix's size. So now that I'm just imagining that, um, like, uh, what's the three-hour mob movie that came out? Um, oh my gosh, I'm blanking on it right now. I don't know its name. Um, I know what you're talking <laughs> about, but yeah, I want to say The Godfather, even though that's not at all what I'm thinking of. No. Um, but it's just the like Irishman? watching it as course. The, yeah, Irishman. the Irishman. There it is. Okay. Thank you, it's, Kevin. It's like, um, it's like watching the Irishman as as they intended on my little Google Home. <laughs> it's like, no, <laughs> please don't. I'm gonna it's like, watch is that it HDR? My... Uh, no, no, I don't think so. <laughs> I'm going to watch it on my Echo Spot. Um, that's, for anyone who doesn't know, it's a little circular clock. <laughs> oh, yeah, the thing. dot. <laughs> um, no. Uh, this, is, this is fantastic, this next bit of news. So... It was just, I believe, yesterday, maybe two days ago, um, my partner came up to me and he said, look at this. And he was showing me uh, a Facebook video uh, from that 
next now news new now next whatever it now is this. now this now this thank yeah. you um <laughs> now this news thing and it was talking about it was showing some nest uh cameras that that had been hacked into and people were communicating with the owners of these nest cameras so uh, you know, there was a, a young woman who was in her bedroom and someone started talking to her in her bedroom and then proceeded to call her racial slurs. Uh, there was another situation where uh, a man was outside and the Nest security camera was hacked into and then the person was um, – turning on the security alarm on it and another one where the person was pretending to be a sort of computer generated voice. And so of course these are people that are horrible troll people. And, uh, you know, as I'm watching it, I'm thinking, okay, you know, I know what we've got here. This is a situation where someone used the same password on that random, uh, website where they bought some custom t-shirt uh, as the same password that they use on their their Gmail account as the same password that they use on their Nest account, et cetera. That T-shirt website got hacked. They got the email and the password, and then they logged into the Nest account and were able to gain access to that as well. Or a phishing scheme, a social engineering scheme, whatever. Uh, and so Nest's response was, of course, that it was not responsible for... Um, for these hacks, it wasn't as if its systems were hacked. This was yeah. not a you know a, a company issue. This was an individual account issue, and so Nest said, "Look, what you need to do is enable two-factor authentication, and you need to do this and you need to do that. This is not our fault. There's nothing that we can do about it if you're not using passwords that are strong enough." And so there was some kind of anger about that, but knowing how this works i was you know kind of perturbed by the fact that there was anger from people because it's not anything that nest can do there's yeah. you know Let's all they can do is encourage it uh encourage you reuse the same password or it was leaked online like that's what i was just looking for is have i been pwned.com where it's yes. like has somebody taken has my email and password been leaked online and then if they do that they can easily copy and paste that in so now you have to like get the second confirmation on your phone that it's actually you before. But it is like, I mean, it's always interesting. Like I'm always scared with two factor authentication, especially when it's forced just that like, I don't, it scares me to just get in that situation where you don't have the access that you need and things like that. Um, like I'm always worried that at some point I'm going to like not have my second device and be like, I don't know what to do, but I don't, I guess it hasn't never, happened to me so know. far. So. Yeah, I've never had that that fear. My fear is greater that I'd be hacked and have someone saying horrible things to me than my fear of of not having you know That's the <laughs> my login to one password or whatever password application with the you know URL. So or, or the OTA. Yeah, um, so for me. You know, I think that that's the the better choice. But th this story is that Google is now enforcing email-based two-factor authentication on Nest accounts. So you are going to be required essentially to have two-factor authentication, and that is to keep these accounts uh, safe, even if they don't, you know, necessarily want to. Uh, this is the same thing with uh, Apple. A long time ago, made its Apple ID. Uh, two-factor, multi-factor, uh, depending on which you know mode you go with, and so it's it's clear that this is the right move. Frankly, mm -hmm. we have to keep ourselves safe, and uh, I know that it can be inconvenient, but I don't know about you. I find it way more inconvenient to have some stranger peeping into my space and saying horrible yeah. things to me. So just invading your privacy, yeah. Far lesser of two evils. <laughs> Well, at least we're at this point now, which is good. <laughs> yes. Uh, what's up next with Google uh, Nest cams that are yeah, hopefully two-factor authentication secured? That's what I was going to say. There's definitely privacy involved in this one. But um, at the Mount Sinai Hospital in New York, they're working with Google Nest to have on-premise cameras that basically track people and tell who was exposed and things like that. Um, 
So they do have like a whole fancy system that they're setting up more than a hundred rooms, it says, and then they want to do up to 10,000 of them overall with like custom designed monitoring situations. Um, and also they'd never keep any of the footage or anything like that. Um, but yeah, this is a pretty solid move. Like Google's like, this is one of the benefits of having acquired nest so long ago is that now they're in a place where they can do something like this and actually make a real difference. Very cool. I, I mean, I think that's fantastic. Um, and then finally, in in italics, uh, finally, 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 hopefully this is going to result in a good thing. Uh, Google is bringing all of its messaging and communication apps under a single team to be led by Javier, so Javier Soltero, who is the VP and GM of G Suite. So there are a lot of words in there. Uh, but basically, Javier Soltero runs G Suite, which is Google's sort of business platform. So, for example, a company can uh, sign up for having Gmail and Calendar and Docs and all these things that are via the business platform G Suite. Uh, Google has long been sort of <laughs> uh, rightfully, I feel, uh, teased or or criticized for creating messaging platforms and then quickly and succinctly making them no longer a thing, sunsetting them. And that is, I, I mean, it, all these different types of, oh, you can video message here and you can chat here and you can send text messages on this, this system, but you can't do this over here. It's just been a mess. And so I feel good about this, that they're bringing it all <laughs> under one roof. Hopefully that this is going to lead to uh, one system to to rule them all and make it so that we don't have, you know, somebody falling in love or, or really enjoying one system and then having that get closed down. Um, I think yeah. that this is a good thing. But I don't think they're going to move there just immediately. Like he he is saying it would be, I think it's kind of one of those things where he's going to take it and sit for a while and really make sure they all work together or at least like, I mean, if anything, just the communication around these is, is what's so confusing. Because like, even though it says it in the article, I think my eyes glazed over as I was reading, like <laughs> which one is which. And he's like, it, it is hard to, even though the, like people want it all unified, like giving you a work tool that is also to use just for like hanging out with your friends doesn't always make sense. Um, right. So at least like if they can communicate that and like this article is saying too, like they have to extricate for themselves from the history of their apps and Google plus and things like that. But I think moving forward under one team should, should help with that. Although I don't think it's going to be like G chat for everything. No. It, yeah. And, and that's, just yeah, it's it a, doesn't make it's sense. A, yeah. It's a PR situation as much as anything. Um, because yeah, it's like the story too. Like even though you use messages and FaceTime and phone separately, it's just like simple that way. And for whatever, it's just like Google Duo, Allo, even the <laughs> fancy names and stuff like that just start to like be like, what are you guys doing again? Or like people just don't trust that it'll last. So if they can like put a stake in the ground and stick with it for a while, then maybe we'll be good. I think I'm going to message Mr. Soltero though and say, um, you know, there's just, there's one, one system that I'd love for you to sort of bring back and that's uh, Google Reader. Um, if you think maybe you wouldn't mind bringing back Google Reader while you're working on all of this, I think that what would happen is you would make a lot of people very happy and they would forget about all of the mistakes you've ever made at Google. So, you know, uh, that's all I'm asking for, please. Uh, Good hear me, that. believe me, <laughs> trust me and bring back Google Reader. He's like marked as spam. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, actually, it's already set up. The filter set up. Uh, if you yeah. if you email him with the word Google and Reader right next to each other, it goes to spam immediately. Um, <laughs> let's move on. I'm sad. <laughs> uh, 44 million U.S. adults <laughs> use borrowed accounts to access streaming services. All right. Re share of hands, who uses a borrowed streaming account here? No. No. I <laughs> you do I not? Either. No. Uh, I was going to say, we I did. I share we, mine. Yeah, that's fair. But You're I the, don't. 
one being mooched upon. Yes, yes, <laughs> exactly. Um, we used to do that with HBO Go, but also that entire platform is just kind of like frozen like three years ago. Like, I don't think you can actually sign in on the Apple TV anymore or something like that. It's really weird. Um, but then we just actually started paying for HBO ourselves. So I guess I'm proud of that. Um, <laughs> and my biggest although thing now I'm just losing more money. Um, Apple TV channels, you know, encompasses yeah. most of those. And I would rather well, be subscribed through yeah. Apple TV channels rather than sort of an external app. So it, yeah, that ends up being great. the reason why I didn't, you know, I, I think that. I've never shared a Netflix account. I think I shared, and I, again, I've never used someone else's Netflix account. I've always had my yeah. own with that. I think that I have shared a Hulu account in the past, um, and I, th I've never personally logged into an HBO account from someone else. But like friends, when I was hanging out with friends, they logged into their parents or something like that. Um, yeah. So yeah, I don't know. I'm not a not. Uh, one of the 44 million U.S. adults, but I'm not surprised is what I'll say. Uh, there was this hilarious, I don't know if you saw it, but there was this hilarious uh, tweet thread where a guy had said that he gave his boss his Netflix login and hmm. he, luck, the boss and him always sort of like tease each other. And so the boss changed his own name to like, king of the house or something like that and then create like, created a profile for himself and then put all of his kids as separate profiles as well there it is and so there were multiple accounts on which he was not uh you know the main one and yeah, so it's like he, his whole boss's family is on his <laughs> netflix account like <laughs> and so he messaged his boss and was like uh nah this is not gonna work and yeah people ended up kind of getting upset about it because they didn't continue to read on, but it's a, they like troll each other. So it was just, it was a funny ha ha between friends. Mm -hmm. uh, it just happens to be the one guy's the boss, one guy's not. So don't get too bent out of shape in seeing this. It really is just yeah. a funny thing. Uh, but I thought that was hilarious. And it did kind of remind me um, a long, long time ago, I logged into my Netflix account at my grandma's place and she didn't realize that at the time, that's not the case anymore, but at the time, all of, excuse me, at the time, all of Star Trek was pretty much on Netflix. And she I, she's the reason why I ever started watching. She and my grandpa are the reason I ever started watching Star Trek in the first place. So we were watching some episodes while I was there. And then when I left, um, I was like, you can stay logged in. I don't care. Uh, so she kept watching you know, Star Trek. Well, I was yeah. on a different series. And so what I ended up doing was I made the main account guest i changed it to the name guest and then i created a second mm. account that was mine um so it was kind of i had that same thing happen because i didn't want to say okay you've got to switch users and da 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 yeah. um but yeah I, I don't know i'm not surprised by this and i don't know do you think this is something that streaming services will try to crack down on do you there, there, i think there's three choices here one they will try to detect and crack down on it Two, they know that this is the situation and it ends up being part of the uh sort of subtle marketing yeah. or three they know that this is part of the situation and they just can't do anything about it so the second one is like actively they know and they are secretly approving of it the third one is they know and they wish it wasn't the case, but they're not going to do anything about it. Or number one was they're definitely going to crack down on this. Yeah. I mean, I thought for a while that, yeah, I was looking for the quote. Uh, one of the HBO executives, they were just like, they knew that it was a problem and they didn't totally care. Or it was just like, what are you going to do about it sort of thing? I, I'm not sure. It's like if you did just totally crack down on everything, like a bunch of people just wouldn't talk about it. So it's like the same thing for me. I did mooch for a long time, but now we're paying for it. So it's kind of like the life cycle of the customer yeah. sort of thing. Um, and it's Brand sort of loyalty. just like free marketing. Like, I mean, I've even seen that criticisms of Quibi is that like nothing from it is going to go viral and like, there are, or there's one story about somebody who has a gold arm and refuses to give it up and dies from it or something right, like that. It's yes. like a very absurd thing. But it's well, just like, I mean, I don't know. I guess maybe people can share their Quibi passwords, but. 
Well, and now Quibi is it's all free at, already. So they're looking at uh, developing a way to share content because of the fact that yeah, there's no way to share content from the platform. Yeah. Um, well, there are ways, but not easy ways. Uh, but yeah. So anyway, that's interesting. And yeah, I think that I think it's the second one. They know that people share passwords. And you know what? Like you said, you say you're with someone, you and you're partnered up, you're in a relationship, and then you end up breaking up. And then at some point, your ex changes their password. And you love these Netflix shows. Either you're, I guess, go out on Tinder and find someone with a Netflix account, <laughs> or you're just going to own up to it and buy a Netflix subscription. So yeah, it is sort of marketing in a way, uh, if they can get you connected to it. Also, There's I'm realizing that... in here with that, by the way. Um, oh, there's the there's a subscription pair by platform and then like who is helping them with like who they're mooching off of and for x is on netflix is 1.7 percent prime video is two percent hulu is 4.7 and then wow. disney plus is zero so it's like you if you have disney plus it's like you're married <laughs> you have kids or something <laughs> like that or you're like already in a relationship and then nobody like, wants people to pay with hulu, hulu it's like so they're yeah, just willing to let yeah i don't know that's wild. like i we had our friend's Hulu subscription and I think they might have changed the password or something. So otherwise I would still be using it. But every time we try to sign in, it doesn't work. And I'm now like, I think we used it enough that we don't want to ask if like, again, what her password is or if they just like asking someone if they change it oh, is like a yeah. way for them to That's remember awkward. that they, that you're doing it and stuff like that. So, <laughs> Oh yeah, that gets awkward. Doesn't it? Hmm. Um, okay, let's, uh, let's go ahead and move on. Um, sure. spot. Okay. So this, I thought was a fun thing and it reminds me of Spotify of yesteryear and also some online platforms. Um, it's a new feature that lets multiple people control a listening session. So it's called group sessions and it allows a person to share the sort of DJ experience. Now it's, out in beta and it only is for premium users. So you as a premium user and another person as a premium user can take advantage of this. You cannot use, you know, premium and free user. Um, so it's, it's a code that you scan and then it gives those other people access to playback control. So they can pause, they can play, skip, select some songs, um, and add to the queue. And then the queue updates on everybody's devices and then if you are not doing it, if you're not doing anything to the music for uh, about an hour, then the session will end. Um, it's, I mean, I think that this is fun uh, and gives people the ability to, you know, work together to create a uh, music listening experience and kind of reminds me of that, on what is it, DJ, that online DJing. Uh, Turntable FM. Turntable FM. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that, I'm you, that service lets you like host DJ rooms where you could play music and it, people could like join and listen along and stuff like that. Um, yeah, this is awesome. Like this is every service should have something like this. Spotify has always had the like if on your own devices you can control it on any of them like the playback, but it is. I thought it was interesting. Like they said in their immediate vicinity, but I'm curious if it. If it is just a code, like anybody in the world could do it in theory. Um, like it'd be cool to do a stream or something where, I mean, I guess maybe not a stream because everybody would get like copyright violation, but um, just like having people around, like random people around the world play you music or something like that could be cool. Like post your code online, but I guess we'd have to try that out and see. But yeah, these are amazing. Like I've always, I mean, <laughs> I just remember we talked about me wanting to be able to, um, go skating and listen to the same thing at the same time on skateboards on like different headphones. And now either person could control it too. So that could work. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Up next is Spotify uh, saying, look, we've shouted, we've screamed, we've railed, we've, we've fought. And it does seem that Apple is going to open up even more in the future. So you may remember that Spotify put out a kind of open letter about Apple where they felt, where Spotify felt that Apple was 
kind of doing Spotify dirty with the 30% app store tax and the inability to control uh, Spotify using the HomePod and all of these different, you know, I think fair critiques or most of them anywhere were fair critiques. And then we kind of check in with Spotify to see, okay, so how, how do we think this is going? Um, and Daniel Eck, the CEO of Spotify says, look, I think that as uh, time goes on, we're going to continue to see Apple being more open about it. And here's a quote directly. We're very encouraged about being able to now finally use Siri as a way of building in voice support and also being available to build products for the Apple TV and Apple Watch, something that we haven't been able to do until very recently. So this is, you know, uh, a whole... A whole new system that, you know, we, we've seen Apple doing this for a time. And I guess the hope is that they continue to add more um, tie-ins. But I don't know if this is just, I mean, maybe Spotify helped bring this about, but it seemed to be part of Apple's plan for a <laughs> long time now with, yeah. with Siri shortcuts and, um, you know, Siri intents and everything. Yeah, I mean... Those are relatively new. Like, I'm as I mean, I can't speak to like any plans before I got there or something. But like, uh, the shortcuts team has only been part of Apple for a few years. But even still, just like the overall progression of Siri, it does seem like right now was already the logical point of where things could open up. Um, and I mean, I think that I've always like tried to keep in mind is just like they had to have a route to be able to do this type of stuff. Like Siri was built through their own systems and through their own APIs that they're paying for. So like in order to use Spotify's, they'd have to integrate with Spotify's API and pay them and things like that. So having it work locally through something like Siri shortcuts could be the vector for stuff like these services to be able to integrate with Siri more natively. But I do think it's like, it all needs to get better than the current system. But WWDC is only like a month away, a little over a month away. So maybe we'll Can't see wait. some of that pretty soon. Yeah, that could be very cool. Like, I'm super excited, especially like, I don't know. I, this almost seemed like a teaser where they're like, they've been working with Apple this year specifically to improve their series stuff. So I hope that just like continues to, it's like rumors of HomePod minis and things like that. It could all line up like very, very nicely. Yeah, 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 let's hope. Um, All righty. And then last but not least for this week, Tinder is working on another uh, activity from home (laughs) uh, opportunity. So I remember being on Tinder when Tinder did this swipe night thing and it was like, it was a video series. It, it felt very Snapchat. It was a video series. And so you'd, ooh, swipe. See, people, you've got to tune in because Kevin does some clever things whenever you watch via video. Uh, and, you know, if you don't tune in, then, of course, you can watch it afterward on YouTube. But either way, got to check it out that way. Anyway, so you would watch this video and then you would do a choose your own adventure style thing. So you'd say, you know, there's a person, there was a dog running away and then there was a person who maybe was going to be harmed. And so you said, do I save the dog or do I save the human being? I could, you probably guess it, <laughs> what I went after, but anyway, by doing so, <laughs> then you could kind of compare yourself with other people that you were swiping through afterwards. So you could see, Oh, that person also saved the dog. They're probably a dog person. Um, mm. And so then, you know, there were some some connections there. This is trivia night that, that they're working on now. And it's, you know, it's just a test. It's going to an undisclosed percentage of, of users. Don't know who will or won't have it. Um, I thankfully am no longer on the platform because I'm <laughs> uh, secured down. So I won't be able to see this. But I, I think that this is a pretty cool thing um, that lets you, you know, uh, in theory, along with with playing with some friends and some different people on Tinder, you can also kind of get to know others a little bit more. Um, So any sort of ability to, we've talked about this pivot in this time where, you know, why are we going on to Tinder? 
if we can't go on dates, you know, or yeah. why are we going on to Tinder if it's just ends up being like, oh, I really want to meet you. But right now we can't do that. So Tinder is looking for different ways to still be engaging during this time. And I think this is a, a clever way of doing it. So I, I just wanted to touch on that as well. Yeah, it is interesting. It's like the the like neo modern era of date, dating where it's like already <laughs> Tinder to me was never something that I used. And so it's like it's like another step beyond that where it's everybody video chatting in the dating service. Yeah. I mean, I can't imagine, uh, I mean, even just being alone, like fully alone in a a situation like this would be hard. And then also like trying to meet people long term would be difficult. So it is, there's a lot of clever digital social experiences coming out now, which is good. It's like at least that part of society is more accepted and common. Now it's like, work from home stuff is going to be pretty regular or like people who weren't convinced in the future. So maybe this is like the same thing for online dating. Yeah. Uh, Alrighty. Let's take a quick break before we round things out with our projects and picks. Uh, this episode of Smart Tech Today is brought to you by A Good Night's Sleep via Casper, an online retailer of premium mattresses for a fraction of the cost. In fact, its products are cleverly designed to mimic human curves, providing supportive comfort for all kinds of bodies, you spend one third of your life sleeping. So by golly, you should be comfortable. Now, we start with the original Casper mattress. That's the one I have. that I've had for years and I love. Uh, it combines multiple supportive memory foams for a quality sleep service with the right amount of both sink and bounce. Even to this day, still has that perfect sleep surface. Its breathable design helps you sleep cool and regulates your body temperature throughout the night. Uh, temperature is very important at night. You should sleep pretty cool. And this mattress helps to do that. Uh, With over 20,000 reviews and an average of 4.8 stars across Casper and Amazon and Google, Casper is becoming the internet's favorite mattress. Now, there are other mattresses as well. There's the Wave, which has a patent-pending premium support system that mirrors the natural shape of your body. There's the Essential, It's a streamlined design with a price that won't keep you up at night. And there is the hybrid. That's the one we see Leo on, if you're watching in this uh, video. It combines the pressure relief of the award-winning foam with durable yet gentle springs. That's right, folks. Springs are back and better than ever. Casper also offers a wide array of products uh, like pillows and sheets to ensure an overall better sleep experience. And boy, howdy, are all of those products fantastic. I've got Casper sheets and pillows and the bed frame and the box springs and all, I mean, the, all of the Casper all the time because I bought the mattress and I loved it and I went back for the sheets and I love those. And so I went back for the pillows and I love those. I've been happy with every Casper purchase I've made. Uh, you, of course, if you want to check this out and you're going, well, I don't know. I, uh, what, what if I don't, what if I don't like the mattress? Well, I think you will, but you can be sure of that purchase with Casper's 100 night risk free sleep on a trial. That's right. Casper wants you to spend a hundred nights on this mattress to be sure that it's what you want. And Casper of course also offers free shipping and painless returns to the U S and Canada. So if you do end up sending it back, I don't, I don't think you will, but if you do, it's a uh, going to be an easy process. Get a Casper mattress today. You can save $100 towards select mattresses by visiting casper.com slash STT and using the code STT at checkout. That's $100 off select mattresses by going to casper.com slash STT and entering the code STT at checkout. Terms and conditions apply. Our thanks to Casper for sponsoring this week's episode of Smart Tech Today. Hey, hey, let's talk about something that you and I both have had to deal with Matthew Casanelli, and that is AirPods, Uh, AirPods Pro to be specific. So uh, AirPods Pro have had, for some of us, this issue issue where our, uh, it's hard to tell exactly what's going on, but it it appears that the sort of uh, group think is that the, little microphone, because there's a microphone that faces into the ear and a microphone that faces outside of the ear. And those microphones listen for sound in both of those places. And it uses that sound to inform the active noise cancellation technology 
uh, it, it uses it to inform how it should enable itself and how exactly it should work. And so by listening to those places, it puts out sound that is the exact opposite of the sound that is in those environments. And so it essentially cancels out those sound waves by, by doing that. So that's kind of how active noise cancellation works. The unique thing about the unique thing about Apple's AirPods Pro uh, is that there's a microphone facing into the ear and out of the ear. And the theory is that the microphone facing into the ear might start to experience some sort of malfunction. And that is causing this crackling, rattling, um, I don't even know. There there have been some different terms to describe it. And I also had like a ghostly howl uh, in mine as well. And so all of these issues, uh, it was in my right AirPod Pro and led me to want to, uh, or I, I completely stopped using my AirPods. I was, I haven't been using them for probably two or three weeks, maybe even longer, uh, because it was so annoying. This every time I would move <laughs> my head just constantly in that ear. Yeah. And if I turned off the ANC, then I didn't hear it. But the whole point of having these things was that the <laughs> ANC yeah. was really nice. So anyway, um, you and I both uh, had this issue. And Matthew, did you end up um, going through the process? Can you talk about the process of, of doing the return uh, and what that was like? Yes, I've got my little single AirPod here that they shipped Um and basically, I mean, first I went through the Apple support app and AirPods are like located at the very bottom, which isn't, it's like not in the devices section. They have their own down at the bottom. And then I chose to send them a message and then it did like the business chat conversation. Yeah. And, and we had this whole thing where he was like, are you sure it might be the beta? And I was like, <laughs> no, this is definitely it. Um, but I got probably the most unglamorous Apple box ever. I mean, it's still, yes. of course, like. Still does the thing where it slides open, but it's just like plain white, no label or anything. And then on the inside, it does have like the little AirPod packaging, like just one of them. Um, mm -hmm. And then two spare headphones or sizes. So you they always like replace all of them. But um, then you need and to go in. And the pairing instructions uh, are in the bottom of the box. Yeah. And they did not, not make real. sense. <laughs> yeah. I had no idea what <laughs> I was supposed to do. Like, did you have that same issue? Um, it's like, well, it's like, put them in, plug it in, and then in, press and the button. And then press and the it, button. It has no mention, which is, I found eventually that you might have to wait 20 minutes for them yes. closed to pair again. And so essentially, I had to do they this don't. Multiple times. Yeah. Yeah. So essentially, they don't. Um, so most of the time when you get an Apple product, it's about 75 to 95% charged already. Um, but for some reason, these AirPods Pro. Uh, are it, it must not be charged to a level where they feel comfortable allowing you to pair it unless it is a proper amount charged. So you have to plug it in for about 20 minutes so that the AirPod gets a good enough charge. Otherwise, you'd have the issue where during pairing it dies and then it could lead to more pairing issues. So I wasn't, hey, are you, you sure though? Because when I repaired them, I switched back to test it later and they ended up... Um, it still needed to do the 20 minute process. So I thought it was just that, I mean like, cause when you plug it, if you put in an AirPod that isn't correctly paired, it will like flash cause it's like, this isn't your AirPod. It's like assuming you're accidentally swapping with somebody. Um, but I thought oh. it almost had to do with like, it gives the other AirPod enough time to like basically disconnect and then update the firmware to like repair them or something like that. Um, uh, not okay, necessarily so then, cause it didn't, I didn't have to like wait for the charge per se. I want, so it must be, it's yeah. a, it's probably a multi multi-factor situation, um, that I, you know, I, I only, you know, got part of that. Also, that. But. Uh, yeah, I think it's, yeah, it's more of an also thing rather than an or thing because now I'm thinking about it too. And I feel like 20 minutes is a good grace period to say, if this AirPod is still in this case, 20 minutes later, then it means that if you had borrowed it from a friend, 
in theory, they would have asked for their AirPod back by 20 minutes. You know what I mean? So yeah. it's almost a, it's a check for that to make sure that it is truly your AirPod. And then it's a check uh, or it's a thing to make sure that the AirPod is fully charged. And then it is also a check to make sure that it updates to the proper firmware. Yeah, it sounds like it it sort of covers all of those bases. And the, the forum that I was reading was just covering the, the battery part of it. Yeah. Uh, because you'll like Apple Watch, it has to be above 50%, yeah. 50% even when it's on the charger in order for you to install an update um, so battery does excuse me battery does play a role but yeah it's i think it's a an okay. everything and so i wish that that piece of paper had <laughs> yeah, a wait little clock minutes. yeah a little clock with a little bit of a duration thing and then underneath in in um, apple's san francisco it's a typeface it said 20 minutes or something because I didn't know, and I'm going, um, why is this not working? Why is this not working? So finally, I looked up pair replacement AirPod, and uh, it took me to a support document, not for the AirPods Pro, but for the standard AirPods. And luckily, the process was the same for those. So yep. I was able to then pair it. Um, yeah. So I ended up doing that like multiple times because I wanted to, I like had just gotten mine and then. Um, switched them, and then Apple came out with a firmware update, and so everybody oh, was trying to figure 15. out. Yeah, exactly. Like, does does this fix it? And like, I kind of wish I had had already fixed them and listened to them again before the change because I was curious if it was different. Um, but it did not fix the problem for me. Just to be clear, and also, I guess I should. My problem was that it was whenever I was touching the outside speaker grill, it would start to buzz, and so like. I'm not entirely sure if I had the same problem as someone else. Oh, like I should be clear. Time. Mine is not an or. It's an also with that as well. When I touch the outside, it would also make that sound. Okay. So that's, mine did both. Because that's like one time my girlfriend's AirPod freaked out. And we thought it was because if you have like moisture on the top of your hand and then you reach in and try to touch this like to close it or just like stop it or pick it up or something. Like if moisture got in there, it could freak it out. Um, I... I do not have water damage on mine, and I swear <laughs> I don't want to get mine canceled or something like that. Um, or like have you have sent yours back I'm yet? Pretty sure. No, I still have it. That's also I need to do that right now because yeah, it's due you tomorrow, really and need they're going to gonna charge back. me. I went and found my. I don't want to hold up the side with my shipping label, but I found this in the trash because I didn't realize they had prepaid the label and everything, and I was like, "Oh, oh god!" Um, I'm glad you got it before it went. Oh boy! <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Give like, me a little bit I'd of pay a, another eighty yeah, dollars so, for. Ugh. Those of you out there, uh, be aware of all of those things. Now you know. In fact, Kevin will probably have to cut this out as uh, a little package to give to people how to uh, replace your AirPods Pro. Um, because one thing that you need to make sure that you understand is that you probably have to wait 20 minutes for the thing to do all of its necessary updating and pairing and charging and all that kind of stuff before you can reconnect them. Then secondly, know that if you did do the return order, you need to return the AirPod uh, that you, you know, the faulty one and that you need to do it within a certain period of time. I think Apple says 10 days from the day that they shipped it, uh, you know, barring any issues. And then also understand that they include the shipping label on the package. Uh, there's yeah. a little tab that you can fold back and forth it's perforated you tear it off and then you can tear off your shipping label to you and the new shipping label is underneath and apple makes it easy you slide in the the box and then you peel back this little sticky and you can fold it over unless you're like me who didn't see that the package was perforated and so he cut the top of it with scissors and now yeah, has to do some taping magic <laughs> to make sure that it all goes together so don't be like matthew casanelli and myself now you know what you need to do if you have to replace one of your AirPods Pro, which it's sounding more and more like a lot of people are having to replace theirs. Yeah. So here's all the advice you need to know uh, um, in order to get your new AirPods Pro. Did, did it help you, uh, the, the replacement? I know you said the firmware didn't fix things, but did the new AirPods Pro um, replacement, has it fixed your issue? Um, yeah, it sounds, I mean, it works now as opposed to not having it. Um, I guess one other thing about that with the whole return thing is that they do like tell you to authorize the charge before they'll send them back. So it kind of weirded me out that I was like, wait, do I have to pay for this now or do I have to pay for it at all? Like you do have to put a hold on your card and then yeah. when you return it, it gets, it like takes that off. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's part of why I wanted to talk about it too, as I was curious I did have AirPods 2, which I was very dumb and bought, and then also bought AirPods Pro. Um, I was glad for this week that I actually had them, but 
it was very interesting not having noise cancellation again because it was like it was like this kind of sucks sometimes <laughs> like which is uh, like terrible and like comes from a position of being able to afford these it's like nobody else has noise cancellation just by default but it was interesting right. especially my girlfriend and i have started to rely on them a lot more like um she'll watch netflix and i will like do something else but we'll be in the same room and both have our airpods and just i mean it's like i would have found that a little bit creepier before but when you are locked at home spending all your time together it's nice to be able to like hang out but still get to do your own thing um yes and even like some some music was like overwhelming like just re-listening to stuff i mean maybe that was part of the update as well but I just love like the little details with noise canceling is on and you can hear like somebody say something in the studio that they left in, but you've never heard it before because you listened on like crummy speakers or something. Um, yeah, I love them. Like they're a killer feature <laughs> for quarantine, especially because it's just like neighbors and stuff you can't block out. And it's like people are like, oh, I'm just going to go outside and play music in my backyard. And it's like, OK, but everybody else is stuck at home. Like, Yeah, um, we all are having to exist to these faces. Come on now. Our yeah. neighbor is probably going to like just moved in and is probably going to raise his house 30 inches. And I was like, please, Why? I want to like write it <laughs> like this is terrible, but I want to like write a complaint to the city being like, don't let them do this during quarantine because that's Why are gonna, they if it's, if it's like house- a two month process. I, it's like an old house and I think they don't actually have the first floor as a like livable space. So it could oh. potentially they're going to like turn that into rooms, probably rent it or something. I don't know. It's very, it's like Bay Area housing. It's a perfectly non-contentious issue. Um, <laughs> and now <laughs> I'm like a fine. NIMBY. Like it's like, it's like, oh, I don't want the noise in my neighborhood. But it's like we're working from home. That can be a pretty, it's like extenuating circumstances. So. At least if it does happen, I will definitely be wearing my AirPods every single day. (laughs) Mm. Makes sense. Um, Okay, let's go ahead and move on to our picks of the week. And Matthew, let's hear from you first. Sure. Um, I wanted to point everybody to an episode of App Stories, which is um, one of the podcasts from MacStories.net with Federico Vitici and John Voorhees. And this episode is... Federico interviewing Craig Federighi from Apple. So he's he went on App Stories after WWDC last year, I believe, to talk about iPad updates. And this is him kind of walking through Apple's explanation of like how they came up with the iPad cursor and sort of what it means for the platform. Um, it's super awesome to just like hear straight from somebody who is at Apple, who's in charge of all of this stuff, like why (laughs) they made these decisions and what it means or like how he uses his iPad to get things done. Um, So that was a really cool conversation. Um, Yeah, it's like right at the end, uh, I will like he said something that was like similar to something that I've been trying to like, I'm trying to like do an iPad review. And I was like, crud, now just Craig said, I can't say stuff like that. Like, I don't want to like how you change it and stuff like that. Um, But is it's a really cool story. Like it is a good confirmation knowing that Apple's thinking through all of the different ways you use these devices and, and sort of like, he's like, it still has to work with touch and things like that. So it is a good read if you're interested or good listen, if you're interested (laughs) in the (laughs) iPad. What's your pick? Uh, Yeah. So my pick is a product that uh, I believe it was Mr. Leo Laporte who mentioned this on the last iOS today. And these are, they're called light dims and light dims. Uh, you can get them for six dollars and fifty cents on Amazon. Uh, they are these different little stickers that come in different shapes and sizes, and you put them on devices in your home or in your hotel room where there are LED indicator lights that you don't want blasting your eyes at night. Um, you know, some devices. I've gone as far as taking apart certain devices and disabling the LED or covering the LED within the device. Uh, But you can't do that always because sometimes it's part of the circuit. And so disabling the LED will actually make it so that the product doesn't work. And obviously it takes a lot more work to take apart a product and, and disable the LED that way. So these little stickers 
just go over those little LEDs or other indicator lights and help to cover it up. Now, there are two different kinds. There's the light dims standard or what have you, where they just make that indicator light a lot less bright so you can still see it, but it doesn't shine as brightly. I recommend those especially for blue light. Uh, but then there are also the complete blackout ones where putting it over the indicator light will completely cover that LED. And so I got a I got both uh, so that I can do, you know, use both of them on different things. Um, and I want to talk about why this is so important. So uh, be our eyes, um, it's very cool. Our eyes, of course, are uh, behind them is, is the ocular nerve. It's, you know, on, in both of our eyes, there's an ocular nerve that leads back th- to our brain. And in, there, in that space, sort of right in the middle, is something called the suprachiasmatic nuclei. And it is the one nerve um, structure that has direct connection to our ocular nerve. So it's essentially looking out into the world as we are looking around. You can think of it as kind of an ambient light sensor in a device, the suprachiasmatic nuclei. And so this suprachiasmatic nuclei is responsible for telling our body what it needs to do in terms of uh, winding down for sleep when it's time to go to bed, when it's time to wake up. It is in charge of telling all the different systems in our body, hey, uh, pineal gland, it's time to start producing melatonin, and hey, this and hey, that, you know, let's uh, cut back, or rather, um, yeah, yeah, cut back on histamines in our in our brain, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so it's an incredibly important and incredibly sensitive uh, structure within our brains because, again, it is the one structure that is directly connected to our eyesight. Other things sort of have to work through different filters and processes, but literally closing my eyes and opening them, the suprachiasmatic nuclei can see or not see what's going on and then start to tell the body what it needs to do. When you have lights like this, um, I, I'm pointing as if you can see this, but you can't. Um, I've got a, a little USB hub that has some blue indicator lights on the side. If I shut off the lights and those lights are still shining, The suprachiasmatic nuclei, if your eyes are open, and sometimes even if your eyes are closed because your eyelids are not, oh my goodness, look at that light, um, are not completely, you know, uh, able to cut off the light, then they can start to see that and it causes your suprachiasmatic nuclei to tell the rest of your body, hey, hold on, there's still light outside, it's not time to go to bed. Um, As much as I love artificial light because it is responsible for almost every modern miracle and technology we have, our bodies were utterly beeped by, um, by artificial light and utterly harmed by artificial light. <laughs> and so it has caused you know, an issue for us to be able to uh, have our bodies properly tell us when we need to go to sleep. And that's why we take melatonin supplements and uh, find different ways to sort of wind down at night. So it is incredibly important that when you sleep in a room, when you go into a room to go to bed, that there is as little light as you possibly can have. And so for 650, you can start to cut back on some of that light and let your suprachiasmatic nuclei do what it is meant to do. So that's my pick of the week. It is a okay. it is not a smart device itself, but it is a device. It is a, a an addition to your smart devices in your home. I really, really wish you were filming me when I opened this link because I was like, "Oh my god!" <laughs> because this is it's like if you're watching, if you're listening to this or watching along now go to the show notes and click on this and buy it because it's the stupid little lights that come on your thing. That's like, Oh, like my dehumidifier now is always shining light no matter what time of day. Uh, Mm -hmm. Yesterday I put my sweater on top of, I was charging like my drill batteries in my bedroom because that was the only available outlet. And I had to block that light. Like this is amazing. I'm going to buy this and I'm pretty sure my girlfriend's going to be like, Yes, because it's just little <laughs> black things that you stick over the stupid little light. Like, ah, that's amazing. And you also have Science Micah with the full reasoning. Of, yes, <laughs> like, that's, yes, that's the reason why you should do that. Um, it, you know, I used to use, I still do sometimes, some electrical tape to do this, but this is so yeah. much easier than cutting up little bits of electrical tape. And as Leo pointed out, these look a lot cleaner and as if they were kind of part of a thing all along. And depending on which ones you get, you know, you could still see those indicator lights, but they're just cut back a lot on brightness. So yeah, uh, check it out. And yeah. 
<laughs> Folks, thank you so much for tuning in to this week's episode of Smart Tech Today. Um, thank you again to, oh golly, now I can't remember, uh, Daniel for your question. Uh, other folks that want their questions answered, please do send us an email, stt at twit.tv. Of course, we record the show live every Monday at about 7 p.m. Eastern, which is 4 p.m. Pacific, which is 2300 UTC. If you go to twit.tv slash live, then you can check out the live stream in general and, of course, see our show there. Uh, of course, head to twit.tv slash STT, which stands for Smart Tech Today, where you can subscribe to the show in all of its various formats, uh, audio and video. And, uh, of course, we've got links to the different apps uh, through which you can subscribe. So be sure to check that out, head there and get the show in whatever format you choose. Matthew Casanelli, if folks want to check out your work online, where do they go? Uh, you should go to YouTube because I am kicking up with some of the streams right now. And I'm going to start mixing them between platforms. But on Wednesday, I did an hour long stream with the developer of Charty, um, which I think was my pick last week. Um, but that was an awesome way to like learn how to build shortcuts, charts with Charty. Um, and then also on Saturday, I did an hour and a half stream with Chris Lawley, who is a fellow shortcuts video iPad creator kind of thing. Um, <laughs> and he walked me through how to use LumaFusion and he brought it. Like he had sample projects for me to look at. And I was like, dude, I just Whoa. was going to like talk to you. And um, he talked about this really cool app for making animated titles and things like that, that I was like, this is legit because um, I'm just trying to use LumaFusion more and actually work from my iPad and all the time now that I have, especially the trackpad and stuff like that. I don't have to worry about RSI moving my stuff around on screen. So pretty pumped about that. But yeah, um, I'm doing a stream also uh, Tuesday with Maddie Cox explaining how the basics of shortcuts works because he has Sweet. no idea and that'll be super fun. Um, and then I'm just trying to do a bunch more. I feel like Micah, you and I, it is very soon that this should happen. So yeah, let's do it. Uh, excellent. You? Uh, if you want to check me out online, I'm at Micah Sargent on pretty much all of the social networks. Um, I just posted uh, pretty excited that my, um, sister joined the mother's day club this year, uh, because she is expecting. So I'm very excited to be having a niece, uh, sometime later this year. Um, very cool. And of course, you can head to chihuahua.coffee. That's C H I H U A H U A dot coffee, where there are links to all of the different things that I do online. All righty, folks. It is time to say goodnight to all of your smart assistants. Good night, everyone. See you tomorrow. Next time. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I'm Jason Howell, host of Hands on Android, a techie look at how to customize your Android device as well as take a look underneath the hood and see what's really going on down there. You can subscribe by going to twit.tv slash HOA, or you can find Hands on Android in your podcatcher of choice.